tracking along with us, you know that we're in a series called The Story of God, and we're in this mini-series in The Story of God called The Promise. And just to review, or for those of you that haven't been with us, you know that we're, we're studying Genesis and Exodus, and we're still in Genesis. And we find out in Genesis 1 that God made all that exists, and He made us in His image, and He made us to have a relationship with Him. And then the next series we were in called Paradise Lost, we realize, we find out that, God, that our relationship with God is broken, and our image-bearing ability is tarnished because of sin. We're separated from him. And the series we're in now, which we finish up this morning, is called Promise, and it's essentially how God's beginning his plan to make all that right, to redeem all that which was lost, to bring us back, to restore the image of God in us, to bring us back into relationship with him. And he does it in a way that none of us would predict or think of ourselves. He does it by calling one man, Abram, out of the nation, a land of Ur, to follow him a man who doesn't have a relationship with him, to trust and leave everything and follow him. And he promises this man he's going to make his name great, which means descendants. And he says, I'm going to give you a child. And then against all odds, over many years, a child is born. And through that child, he's going to make for himself a nation, Israel. And through that nation, he's going to send eventually his son, the Messiah, into the world to save us all and to redeem all things. That's God's reclamation project, which we're studying now, and it begins here in the promise that everything hinges on God's faithfulness to his own promise. A number of years ago, I was in the Target checkout line, and I don't remember what I was buying or why I was there, but I do remember this. I pulled out a $20 bill to pay, and it was one of the old $20 bills. You know, it was the small print, it was really old, and I handed it to the lady, the cashier, who was, she was probably in her late teens, early 20s, young girl. She looked at the $20 bill, looked at me, looked at the bill, looked at me, and then went and got her manager. And he came, and he wasn't much older than she was, and the two of them together whispered, looked at the bill, looked at me, looked at the bill, and then I noticed somebody from our church in the next checkout line who was also looking at me, and I'm thinking, what is that pastor trying to pull over there, you know? I'm like, I promise it's a real 20. Finally, they pulled out some special pen and shined it on the 20 and said, okay, they said it was authentic and I could pay and go on my merry way. And so I started doing some digging into like counterfeit money. Like, did, it, did I unintentionally pass a fake $20 bill? And I didn't know this, but there's all kinds of things they put into the currency to make it authentic. It used to be the little red and blue fibers. Now there's uh, black light that are holograms or the, the ink is actually tinted when you turn the bill. And a friend of mine who, uh, who had worked for the um, FBI uh, also told me that he worked for the Secret Service. I didn't, I didn't know this either, but the Secret Service um, is not only in charge of protecting our nation's leaders, but they're the ones that go after counterfeiters as well. And so uh, one of the things they to he told me, or I discovered, was that in training people that work in this area to find out, to, to track down counterfeiters and, and pursue them, they don't study the fakes. They're absolute experts in the real thing. They become well-versed in, in how to know, tell if it's real. So they know all the marks of authenticity. I would have thought, maybe this is just me, that they would have studied the fake. How do they fake it? But he said there's, they're always inventing new ways to fake it, new ways to, uh, to you know, cut corners and get around it. So the best thing we can do is to know perfectly, to have intimate knowledge of the real thing. And I started to think about that with our, with our faith. What's the test by which you know that your life with Christ is authentic? How do you know if your faith is the genuine article or if it's just pretend? Is there some special light you can pull out of your Bible and, you, and shine on your heart and know that you're real? As I look back over my own life, it's often been those moments that were most difficult for me that proved most important in the deepening of my faith, in the proving of God's faithfulness to me and of the authenticity of my trust in him. Perhaps you can relate to that. C.S. Lewis, we'll get that quote right out of the way. You know he's going to come in eventually, so we'll, we'll say it right away. C.S. Lewis says in his book, A Grief Observed, that God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts in our pains. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. I think he's right. Maybe you don't always see it in the moment, but often looking back at our lives, it's those times that were most difficult, most troubling, most painful, that we find God most faithful, and our faith grows in its depth and its authenticity. And we're going to come now to the story of a man named Abraham, the last part of this series, and it really is the testing of his faith, the proving of his faith, and more importantly, the proving of God's faithfulness to him. James chapter 1 tells us that we should rejoice when we face trials of many kinds. For the testing of our faith prove, provides or 
produces perseverance. And just as there are defining moments in your life and in my life, there are also defining moments in the history of our faith, in the story of God. We're going to look at one of those moments, a defining moment in the life of this man Abraham. Now, he's had many of them, but this is sort of the, the top of the mountain, the quintessential, the peak of his defining moments with God. And it's very important for us. Now, the story we're going to look at is a story some of you will know about called Abraham and his son Isaac and how God asks him to sacrifice his son. It's a troubling story. It's a bit of a horrifying story, really, on a certain level. And if I'm honest, there were times where I didn't want to preach on this one. I'd like to skip over this and go to a different story, a nicer story. But I think it would be glaringly obvious by its absence, and we would miss out on something very important in our faith if we skipped over this story. But I warn you, it's not an easy one to read and to understand. Robert Alter, he wrote, a, he wrote a translation of the first five books of the Bible and a commentary to go along with it. He said that from a literary perspective, this is the high point of ancient Hebrew narrative. And there aren't many stories in ancient literature told better than this one. From an ethical and moral perspective, this story is a bit of a problem. It's brutal. It's confusing. Scholars and theologians, Christian and non-Christian alike, have debated the meaning of this story for centuries. So we're definitely not going to unpack it all this morning in the next 25 to 30 minutes. So I figure since it's cold outside, it will stay for the next hour or two. <laughs> You're like, no, we're not. <laughs> but we can know the heart of it. I hope that we can come to understand the heart of it, and you will walk out seeing the story differently than you've seen it before in your own life with God differently as well. Let's read the story, Genesis 22, verses 1 through 19. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come back to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. He said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. When they came to the place which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Do not lay a hand on, your, on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you have not withheld your only son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the, the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now, we'll get to some of the crazy details in the story in a minute. But throughout the story of Abraham, which is really the whole story of the promise and the story of Abraham, we've seen that the, everything centers around the call of God and the promise of God. In Genesis 12, God calls this man out of Ur, who does not have a pre-existing relationship with him, to follow him and to trust him, to leave everything he knows and to come out from his people and his family and his, and his, uh, and his land and follow God. And he does. 
And along the way, he says, I'm going to make your name great. Now, to us, we hear the word make your name great. You might think things like your 401k or a foundation in your name or a building dedicated to you. But to the, a person in the ancient world, to have your name be made great meant descendants, specifically sons. That's how your name was made great. So Abram, who is childless, is told by this God who he's trusting, I'm going to bless you by making your name great, which means I'm going to make you into many descendants. There's no greater gift in the ancient world than this. That was how you measured greatness. But years go by, and this doesn't happen, and we've read that story, and God reaffirms the covenant in Genesis 15 with this crazy story of the smoking fire pot, the blazing torch, and then finally God comes through. When Abraham is 100 years old, after he and his wife laugh in disbelief, God blesses them by giving them the son Isaac. So you have to see it this way. All that God had promised decades ago has come to fruition in the boy, Isaac. Everything is bound up. All of God's promises, all of Abraham's hope is all bound up in the son. And God's call keeps coming to Abraham again and again. Over and over again. I want to see, look here at the character of the call. The first time the character, the, the call of God comes to Abraham, it's go. Where, God? Don't worry, I'll show you on the way. What are we going to do? I'll tell you on the way. Trust. And every time God's call comes to Abraham, God does not spell out how it's all going to work out ahead of time. He just says, trust me. And in 22, it's similar, isn't it? Go to where? Land, I'll show you. He doesn't tell him why or how it's going to happen or why he's doing this. He simply says, go. Trust me, follow. I'll reveal what's next on the way. You won't know what's next until you take the first step of obeying me and trusting me along the way. And I think we tend to think that the call of God is something that comes to us to trust him once upon a time for salvation. But the call of God is not a one-time thing. It's not a once upon a time thing. If the story of Abraham here in Genesis 22 teaches us anything, it's that you don't retire or graduate or move on past the call of God. Yes, it's true that there is a point in our lives when we come to realize that God calls us into his family by his grace. We, there's, we, we discover, maybe it's a point in time like it was for me in 1987 at Crystal Lake Central High School. Maybe it's a process for you. But whatever the case, you come to the realization that there's a God who made me, who loves me, and I'm distant from him because of my own brokenness and the mess I've made of my life, but he loves me enough to die in my place and redeem me and have a relationship with me. That's God's call. That's the call of salvation. That's God's gracious call and the faith that he gives to trust him. But that doesn't mean that once we do that, we have like a get out of hell free card called Jesus. We put in our back pocket and we just do the best we can until heaven. We just hope that you know, we muddle through. God's call comes again and again, not to save us this time, but to grow us. I want you to hear that it's God's call that saves us, and it's God's call that grows us. He calls you into a deeper relationship, to trust him further, to surrender more. And sometimes that call seems crazy. Sometimes we drift away, and he calls us back. But the important point for us is that God's call, is, it, it continually comes to us to grow us deeper and deeper in our faith with him. And it happens here in Abraham's life. It's God's call that saves. It's God's call that grows. We should never want to be far from the call of God. Martin Lloyd-Jones, in his commentary on this passage, who understood something about the call of God, he was pursuing a, a career as a medical doctor not far from God, and he had his own conversion experience, and he writes about this. The call of the gospel is to recognize that without God, there is no foundation on which to build your life. Therefore, the essence of the call is surrender. This is for Abraham, right? Go, leave, trust, offer up, sacrifice. Because what are you going to build your life on? Think about this for a minute. What are you going to build your life on? What's the foundation on which you find your significance, your sense of purpose? Is it your wealth and your 401k? Well, you know you can't take that with you. But maybe you think, well, that's okay. I want to pass it on so my children have advantages. Statistically speaking, they're going to blow it and mess it up. They are. It'll be gone a couple generations. It's not going to do what you think it's going to do, is the point. What if it's your name and your heritage? How many of you can remember your great-grandfather's name? Anybody? Show of hands. How about your great-great-grandfather? Anyone? One? Great-great-great? Anybody go back three? Last hour, the guy went back five generations. So we'll just say this. Well, do you know what that means? You are within three to five generations of being totally forgotten. Your, your name's not going to be remembered in human history. It's going to be, you know, gone. So what is it? Maybe it's your children. 
Many of you know the pain of, a, of losing a child or know someone who does. Your children can be taken from you. It's, your marriage can be taken from you. Your career can be taken from you. What about your looks and your health? Well, you're all getting uglier. So am I. You, we are. Some of you are holding that off better than others, you know? But we're all getting uglier. Paul says outwardly we're wasting away, but inwardly we're being renewed day by day. My point is this. There's nothing in this life not your family, not your children, not your marriage, not your career, not your bank account, not your looks, not your health. Nothing you can build a life on that will, cannot be taken from you. So the call of God is surrender that which you cannot keep to gain that which you cannot lose. Build your life on the one foundation that can't be taken from you. Offer all these things up to God because they won't last anyway. You, you want a working definition for God in your life? Most of you, I'm guessing, come in here, not all probably, but most of you come in saying that you believe in the God of the Bible. But if we're honest, the way we behave, we might say it, but we don't always live as if we do. We functionally have other gods in our lives, don't we? You want a good definition for the functional God of your life? Whatever you're afraid of losing the most. What is that thing in your life which you think, not this? Anything else? but don't take this from me. What's the thing you hope God never asks of you? What's the thing you just think I cannot live without this? Is it your career? Is it your spouse? Is it your children? That's functionally your God. The call to Abraham and to us is this. Make God the only non-negotiable. Make God the thing you cannot live without. All other loves and, and desires fall into their proper place if we get that right. The essence of the call is to make God the one non-negotiable of your life. But the truth is, God's trying to get us to see this throughout our life. That's why the call keeps coming back, to grow us deeper in his, our trust for him. But sometimes, the God who's trying to grow us feels like the God who's trying to kill us. Have you experienced that? I don't understand. Where are you? What is going on? Elizabeth Elliot, who was the wife of Jim Elliot, who was martyred for his faith in, in Ecuador, he famously said, by the way, he is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose, what we've just been talking about. His wife was a is a beautiful writer. She wrote a little, of a story in one of her books um, called These Strange Ashes. But anyway, the little story is about visiting a friend of hers who owned a sheep farm in Wales and watching the way the shepherds interacted with the sheep. Now, now sheep Sheep are cute on Christmas cards and on like, you know, posters and little fuzzy white sheep. But have you ever been around real sheep before? Anybody? They're gross. Sheep are disgusting. They smell. There's parasites in the wool. Stuff sticks to the wool. And by stuff, you know what I mean? I mean, they, they just, they, they're not very smart. They're kind of gross animals. And these shepherds would bring the sheep along through a narrow corridor with gloves up to their, their shoulders. And they would grab the sheep by the back of its wool and skin, yank it off the ground, and plunge it into these vats of antiseptic to disinfect the sheep from parasites. And they'd have to hold the spluttering, kicking sheep under the vat, under the water of the antiseptic. And Elizabeth Elliot says, wonder what it would be like to be that sheep in that moment, to think your shepherd is trying to kill you, trying to drown you. I think Abraham knew something about what that felt like, to feel like your shepherd, your God, is against you. This brings us to the terror of the test. Now, it's important to be clear that what comes here for Abraham is unique in many ways. The call is universal to all of us, but it takes different shapes, and God is working with one man in history to call out a people for himself, so not everything about the story, thankfully, is universalized. But this story shows up in many places in, in historical religions. It's in the Koran, by the way. You know that the Koran has a high place for this story? of Abraham sacrificing Isaac, but in the Koran, in the Muslim faith, the, the interpretation of the story goes like this. The focus is on Father Abraham and how, how great he is, how strong his faith is. Look at his obedience to Allah. Look how he never questions. Look how he just does what, what is asked of him without, without question or hesitation. And I think sometimes even in Christian churches, we focus on Abraham. What an amazing guy. How did he do that? I could never do that. He's so faithful. He's obedient even when it seems crazy. I think if, that's what we, if we make this an ethical or moral teaching about the need for blind faith or obedience, we miss the whole point. We miss the deeper point. Soren Kierkegaard wrote a book. He's a Danish philosopher and theologian. And he wrote, his book is, one of his books is called Fear and Trembling. It's not easy to read. But he, um, in this book, he basically takes this story 
and says those who would look at this story and say, let's praise Abraham for his obedience, miss the real point because they miss what he calls the terror of the test. They're not really understanding what's going on here. They aren't facing what appears to us to be a horrific thing. We haven't faced it. I don't want to make that mistake this morning. I want us to see what's really happening here. Kierkegaard argues that God's uh, requirements, God's commandments, are, they transcend human ethics. They don't always contradict them, but God's law, God's requirements of us, since he made us, he can ask whatever he wishes of us. And therefore, our obedience is not based on a human moral code, but our obedience must be based on a relationship with him. Because sometimes, God will ask things of us that make no sense, that we would not do if we were just trying to be ethical or moral. In this story. Now, we can't understand this. I know you, I can see by your faces, you're going, huh? I thought the same thing. Unless we understand something about Abraham's day and its context. Notice, God doesn't tell Abraham to murder his son. He says, offer him. It's a very important difference. uh, This is because of the law of the firstborn, what scholars in the ancient world call the law of of primogeniture, the law of the firstborn son. To Abraham, the command of God was terrible, as it is to us, but it was not crazy like it is to us. This is difficult for us in our individualistic society today. You know the phrase, a question you probably were asked when you were a kid, what do you want to be when you grow up? Anybody ever been asked that question before? Anybody ever asked someone that question before? This question would make no sense at all in Abraham's day. What do you want to be when you grow up? That would be, they didn't ask that question. You were what you were born into, the family. And in in the ancient Near Eastern families, the firstborn son got everything, or at least the lion's share of it. And people understood this, why? Because the family's wealth was not in your uh, bank account or currency, it was in land, crops, livestock. So in other words, you could not afford to divide up your wealth, livestock, and land evenly among your descendants. That would put you at risk. It all went to the firstborn son, the heir of the promise. And he was then responsible for taking care of the rest of the descendants. That's how the family kept its place in society and grew its significance and its influence, by keeping that possession, land, wealth together. Everyone understood this. Now, interestingly, in the Bible, God repeatedly cuts against the law of the firstborn. You'll notice, you remember that it's, it's Cain, it's Abel, not Cain. It's Isaac, not Ishmael. It's Jacob, not Esau. It's David, not his older brothers. But nevertheless, all ancient cultures understood the law of the firstborn, that the hope of the family was in the firstborn son, the heir. Therefore, God establishes in the Old Testament scriptures this, uh, this symbolic uh, law, that the firstborn is belongs to him because if the family is like to is is tempted to think that all their hope is in the firstborn son god is saying symbolically no it's not it's in your relationship to me therefore your firstborn is forfeit to me so your hope will not be in your in your firstborn it will be in your god remember the story of the passover right in the passover the, the Egyptians, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt, and the plagues come. The last plague is the plague of the death of the firstborn, right? The angel of death is going to come and going to strike down who? The firstborn of? Some of you said the Egyptians. Actually, the angel of death is going to strike down all the firstborn, unless what? Unless the blood of the sacrificial lamb is over the doorposts. In other words, every person and every family owes a debt of sin to their creator God that they cannot pay. And it, God has the right to call in that debt, even though it sounds crazy to us. And unless there is a redemption, a sacrifice made of blood, then that firstborn is forfeit. This is why when God says this, the angel of death will pass over only those houses that have the blood over it. This is all over the Old Testament. A couple of examples here. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 29. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest and from the outflow of your presses the firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. And flipping to the end, toward the end of the the Old Testament, the prophet Micah in Micah chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. 
All over the Old, these are just two examples. We see this law of the firstborn that God says, that I claim that right, because your hope is not in your descendants, it's in your God. There's a debt of sin that we all owe, and it's serious business, and we can't pay it. There has to be a payment made. So we read the story, and it sounds crazy, like child sacrifice. Abraham hears the command of God, and it sounds horrible, but not crazy. He understood. God is calling in the debt that I owe. Now, I have two sons. I have a firstborn son. You dads here that have sons. It's hard for us to think about this. It's hard for me to preach about it. We all owe a debt we can't pay. And our tendency in our culture is to think, yeah, yeah, God comes alongside and, and tells me, try to do better, I'm going to help you out, you know, and sin becomes you know, something we ought not do. But it's serious. Abraham understood this. If God had come to Abraham and said, kill your wife, Sarah, he would have said, he would have never done it. He would have said, I'm hallucinating, and God would never ask that. But God, when God asked for the firstborn, Abraham, though he is no less terrible and terrifying, understands what God is asking, what he's saying to him. This is the real terror of the test. The command of God here appears to contradict the promise of God. That's the problem in the story, right? I mean, isn't it? Remember, the whole story is the promise of God bound up in this one boy. Now, even though he's an ancient man, I think he's a very contemporary figure in that all of his hope, all of his sense of self and and belief in God, everything was bound up in the success of his child. Nobody here would raise your kids that way, but we know people in our culture that do. That put everything on their kids. And God is now coming to him and saying something. Give him up. Surrender him. So the command is not unjust. I want you to see that. You might not like this, but according to Scripture, the command is not unjust. But the promise is still in effect. I'm going to bless the world through this boy. So how can you require his life? How can the God of the just command also be the God of the gracious promise? They seem like they're contradictory, right? How can he be both? I mean, if God is not just, then what hope is there for the world? Don't we believe that in the end of all things, God is going to right every wrong, wipe away every tear? He's a God of justice. Seek not vengeance for yourselves, trust that to God. Why? Because he's just. He judges. But if God is not gracious, well, what hope is there for you or for me? Because I don't deserve salvation. I don't deserve second chance. So I want a God who's just, who rights every wrong, but I also want a God who's gracious, who's gracious to me and to you. How can God be both, right? This is the the tension in this story. This brings us to the power of the provision. The power of the provision. The emotional center of the story here is in verses six through eight. You know, if you think about it, it's like in in literary terms, this is like the peak of the story, the emotional center, when God, when Abraham takes his son and he, he, carries the wood and the fire and the knife. And then there's this conversation. By the way, it's the only recorded conversation in all of the Bible we have between Abraham and Isaac. The only words spoken between father and son that we we can read are verses 7 and 8 of Genesis 22. When his son says, I see the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb? What does Abraham say? God himself will provide the lamb. God will provide for himself. And by the way, a few verses earlier, Abraham says to his two servants, his two male servants, what does he say? You stay here. Isaac and I will go up and we will return to you. Now maybe you're a cynic and thinking, well, he's just saying that so they don't freak out. But I think we start to put some things together here for what's going on inside of Abraham's heart and mind. Look at how Abraham responds to Isaac's question. God himself will provide now, let's flip to the book of Hebrews for a moment. The, Hebrew, the author of, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11, which highlights a bunch of people that are important in our faith, in verses 17 through 19, refers to this very account in Genesis. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead.
In other words, it's not Abraham's sheer obedience and faith and strength of character and fortitude that kept him going. Have you ever wondered how, what kept him going up that mountain? How did he do that? Was he like a religious little engine that could? I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. I can obey, I gotta obey, I gotta do this. I'm gonna do it. No. The focus is not on Abraham's obedience. It's on the God who would provide. Abraham is saying, I don't know, I don't see, I don't understand, but I trust my God who does. Remember, it's been 40 years plus since God called him out of Ur. He's walked with God and seen God's faithfulness for four decades. This is not the same guy we met in Genesis 12. He's been refined, he's been deepened, he's been hardened and strengthened. He knows something about who God is now that he has not, did not know before. And listen to what he says, God will provide, which is what he names the place. The Lord provides, Jehovah Jireh. Some of you might have grown up singing that song or know that name, Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah the Lord, Jireh provides, is my provider. And and then the saying, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. The word Jireh in Hebrew is from the same root word as the word to see. So literally what Abraham is saying is, I don't see the lamb. You don't see the lamb, Isaac but God will see to the land. On the mountain of the Lord, it will not only be provided, it will be seen. God sees what you cannot possibly see. It seems unthinkable to you what you're facing. It seems crazy to you what he's asking. It seems like against all wisdom, but God sees. Do you trust the God who sees? In fact, even, even in Latin, the word provide, pro before, vide for vision, pro vide, to see before. Provide, prevision, and provision are the same thing to God. God's provision is because God sees ahead of time what you don't see. This is why he can say to him, I'll come, we'll come back. We'll be back. I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know what God's going to do, but I know he's going to do it. God sees what we don't see. That's what keeps Abraham going. Not just this, I gotta do it, even though it's crazy. It's my God, I know my God, I know he sees. Don't you want a God who sees what you don't see? But you're not going to experience that God unless you're willing to go up the mountain. You're not going to know God's provision that way unless you're willing to follow him and respond to his call and trust him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we get the name of this region. Remember God says, go to where I'll show you, the region I'll show you. And in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, we're told it's, they're called the mountains of Moriah. Have you ever wondered where those are exactly? In the ancient world of Abraham's day, there will, it's just a wilderness. You think of mountain, you think of snow-capped peak like the Rockies. That's not what the mountains are in this part of Israel. They're more like hillsides. In fact, you'll see an image of a map here that shows you we are standing looking straight east. On the right, the Mount of Olives where Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Straight ahead, Mount Moriah. You see that gold dome there? Some of you will know this. That's the Temple Mount. That gold dome is the Dome of the Rock. It's a Muslim structure. Do you know what's, why they call it the Dome of the Rock? Do you know what the rock is? Well, they believe it's the very rock on which Abraham brought his son Isaac to offer him. And by the way, you'll also notice that right there, uh, the Central Valley, just this side of Mount Moriah, between Mount Moriah and Central Valley, is where Calvary was. in the same region, the place where God offered his son, his only son, whom he loved. This is why the Apostle Paul could say in Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his only son, he's drawing on Genesis 22 language, will be faithful to redeem you, to forgive your sin. In other words, God is not asking something of Abraham he is not willing to do himself. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be seen. We look back now and see what Abraham could only vaguely guess at, what God would do, how he would do it. Not just because Isaac was spared and a sacrifice in his place, but that sacrifice didn't suffice. There were sacrifices over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament history. Why? Until the perfect sacrifice come. Remember the story of Jesus in the book of John, when John sees him. Right? When Jesus comes out of the Jordan River, what does the voice of God say? This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And then when the, John the Baptist sees him, he says, behold, the Lamb of God who what? 
takes away the sin of the world. Connect that with God's words to Abraham, your son, your only son, whom you love. This is what God provides. This is what God has done. This whole story is to show Abraham and us what God was willing to do, to see to. From the found, but not, not just, you know, after, oh man, they messed it up with sin, but before the foundations of the world, he knew you and loved you and made you, knowing that you would reject him and rebel from him and make a mess of your life, and loving you enough anyway, and us enough anyway, that he would see to his provision so that you could be brought back. You could be spared. God, the debt, God doesn't just, he's not unjust. He doesn't just go, well, you know, we'll pretend that never happened. There is a debt to be paid. Grace is not free. It's only free to you if you receive it. If you understand what God has done. This, that's the beauty of the story. This ancient, weird, terrifying story. I hope you see it's actually a beautiful story. Here's the point I want to leave you with. You don't know God's provision that way. You can't experience the gracious blessing of God unless you're willing to go up the mountain. We would like it to be that way, wouldn't we? I'd rather stay down here, comfortable, safe, and secure, and have you just shower me with love and grace. Can we just have it that way, God? But God says, come, trust me. Lay down all these things which you're going to lose anyway. Surrender everything you're trying to build your life on so that you can establish your sense of who you are on the one thing that cannot be taken from you, my love, my grace, through my son Jesus, my only son, whom I love, whom I gave for you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this strange story. We thank you for its power and what it really points us to. Most of all, we thank you that the one thing in all the universe that is unshakable and can never be taken from us is you and your love through Christ. For all that are here this morning, this Advent season, as we get ready to celebrate Christmas in just a week, press on our minds and our hearts that the baby in a manger is the man on the cross and the one who would conquer the grave the one who is the provision for our sin, the redemption of the world. We thank you and we praise you in his name, Jesus' name, amen. So that song every week in the series, it feels like it was written for this series, doesn't it? My hope will always be in God's promises. I hope you know that as well. Um, a couple of things before we, we dismiss. Uh, first of all, our gift to you for Christmas is leave the chairs right where they are. We want to stay right there. We thank you for that. And I, I should have said this this way at the, a minute ago, and I forgot to. And I want to make sure that you hear it. You know that place in the story where God says, now I know that you love me since you didn't withhold your only son from me? I think God's given us a story so we could turn that around and speak that back to God. You know how you know God loves you? You know how you know you lo he loves you? Because you can say to him, now I know you love me because you did not withhold your son from me, God. There's nothing you wouldn't give. He wouldn't give, and he hasn't given to d demonstrate and communicate and give his love to you. I hope you remember that this Christmas season as you celebrate just a week with your family and friends. Now receive this morning's benediction. May you go in the grace and the love of the Lord Jesus Christ, and may he always be the hope for you, now and forever. Amen. May go in peace.